Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay. In a few seconds, we'll be back with Jeffrey Summers to talk about the death of Gorbachev and the demise of the Soviet Union. Uh, don't forget, there's a donate button at the top of the website. If you're watching on one of the other platforms, YouTube or you know, one of the various podcasts, come on over to the website where you could donate. You can get on the email list, which is quite important, because if you're depending on YouTube, uh, subscriptions don't depend on it very much because YouTube does seems to do its best to suppress us. At any rate, be back in a few seconds. In a recent article in Counterpunch, Jeffrey Summers writes, Terror and tyranny in the USSR arose more from war and the demands of state security services required to survive and the paranoid politics it enabled rather than any, quote, inevitable, close quote, path from the socialist path taken. Once the USSR was past the generation of having gone through this trauma and leaders linked to that generation, a communist party had emerged that sought a return to an ideology anchored in democratic socialism, end quote. That attempt, led by Mikhail Gorbachev, failed. Now joining us is Jeffrey Summers, a professor of political economy and public policy at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where he also serves as a senior fellow at its Institute of World Affairs. In addition to his academic work, he's been published in outlets such as the Financial Times, the New York Times, Project Syndicate, The Guardian, The Nation, Social Europe, and often in Counterpunch. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, Jeffrey. Paul, fantastic to be here. So, so there's a lot to unpack in this paragraph I quoted. So let's start with that. Now, many people are going to argue that all the existing forms of socialism were not very democratic once the revolutionary movements consolidated state power. And, that, and that's, some people argue, inevitable, including some people on the left. So, so let's unpack that paragraph of yours. Well, sure. I mean, so, you know, you have figures like Frederick von Hayek, who was writing at the beginning of the Cold War and asserting in his uh, probably most famous work that socialism is, as he said in the title of that uh, pamphlet or book, the road to serfdom or a kind of slavery, that that was inevitable, it was path dependent, and that is where you would end up. Well, I think Gorbachev proves uh, uh, just the opposite. Uh, that is not uh, uh, inevitable in terms of the final destination for what uh, you know Francis Fukuyama and others would call the end of uh, history if you were looking at uh, socialism and thinking that would be its end. It, it was not. Now, as you, as you uh, rightfully asserted, uh, all of the examples of the kind of state socialism that we're familiar with that were all born out of that Soviet experiment and its terrible experience with the Civil War from 1918 to 1921, and then the uh, uh, traumas of the uh, Stalinist period followed by World War II, and as uh, your guests Noam Chomsky and Daniel Ellsberg uh, recently so rightly uh, referenced, you know, the, the need to have uh, an enemy for the United States and uh, being locked into uh, that Cold War, it, it uh, really uh, created the uh, model for not only the direction that the Soviet Union went uh, when guided uh, by those leaders from Joseph Stalin through to those that were attached to him in one way or another, and all of these other uh, examples of countries that tried to pursue a, I guess for a lack of a better term, a national uh, development model uh, within the context of um, that Soviet uh, example that they looked at. So they set up, you know, uh, uh, their own versions of the KGB, and uh, you know they had uh, states which were uh, rather overbearing. But um, you know, quite interestingly, with Gorbachev, the first top figure, the first general secretary of this Soviet Communist Party that is, you know, entirely delinked from that Stalin period and its leadership, he takes the country in an entirely different direction. So um, I, 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 it's not inevitable that socialism has to uh, end up, like many, if not all, of these state socialist experiments have, uh, 
Uh, but um, uh, it is possible for another direction. All of that said, we should certainly be very wary and learn from the examples of the Soviet Union and the mistakes that were made. So at the time of the Soviet Revolution, um, there was a big debate, and, and I'm no expert on this, but my memory of it all is, I guess, is it Plankinoff on one side, maybe Kotsky and, oh. and Lenin? And they were arguing that Marx and Engels had said that socialism was only possible in an advanced capitalist country when all, essentially when capitalism had produced very internally rationalized monopolies, but in an externally chaotic economy. And that creates the conditions for socialism. And, and Lenin was arguing, yeah, you may be right, but the weak link of imperialism is all these countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and that's where you're actually going to have the revolutions. And so we can make it work. And, and they were arguing, well, no, you can't. Did it turn out that Lenin, was Lenin wrong? Or had, Len, you know, some people argue if he'd lived, he would have adapted. Uh, what, uh, but, what, you know, is that the fundamental underlying problem that if you try to build social, my, my uncle used to have this line. He was a lefty all his life. He says, socialism in a backward country is backward socialism. <laughs> well, well, you, you certainly have uh, the, the debate as it was framed uh, correct. And, you know, of course, uh, um, there wasn't a lot of room for agency here. So the, the Bolsheviks found themselves in charge of a, a country. You know, it had just collapsed. They were the only ones that, in effect, had a program for what to do uh, for a, an empire, which had absolutely been devastated by war. Its people were hungry. Uh, and, you know, they had a program and, and were willing to, to move forward. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a question which I, I, I a counterfactual which we'll, we'll, we'll never really, I think, at least in the near term, know the answer to. Uh, you're right, absolutely went uh, contra the you know, reasoning that uh, Marx and uh, Engels laid out for how you could have a, a successful socialist revolution. And at the same time, uh, it's interesting that all those revolutions occurred in uh, more backward parts of the of uh, the world system, it, and by backward, I, you know, I don't mean so much pejoratively, but just in terms of their levels of development. And Mark uh, uh, Basinger at Princeton just published a, uh, a new book this year, The Revolutionary City, which uh, deals with some of those contradictions, and uh, you know, they're, they're certainly interesting uh, uh, questions. Uh, but uh, did Lenin uh, give rise to uh, Stalin? Um, in some ways, yes. Uh, uh, in all ways, no. And so it's 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 not an easily um, answerable question uh, for that reason. There are just too many contingent uh, uh, variables, and uh, uh, we don't have the ability to play out, you know, um, alternate scenarios. But in terms of learning lessons from it. Um, is one of the lessons is you can't judge the potential of socialism by the attempts to build socialism in countries that, you know, in some ways weren't ready for it, at least not at the pace. Like I've always thought, and this may also have to do with external factors like threats. And, and they, I mean, the Soviets knew the rise of fascism in Germany and, uh, you know, Japanese imperialism and, and they knew that from like 1931, the 30, I mean, it was very, it wasn't news to them what was coming. So the external factor was a big factor right from early in Stalin's time. Um, so they're preparing for the possibility of some kind of war. On the other hand, is, is the pace, like in terms of agrarian reform and other things, the pace of which Stalin conducted it required such force and instead of dealing with what was possible, they try to make it possible. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the old uh, Soviet uh, historian who himself spent some time in, in the camps, Moshe Levin, uh, used to like to say, uh, the rapid industrialization of the 1930s was possible without using the degree of force that uh, uh, Stalin uh, did use. Um, you know, the, 
the conditions in which uh, the Soviets found themselves in the 1930s were very tricky. I mean, not only did they have all of these external threats, uh, which were very real, uh, as we know, uh, but additionally, there were world market conditions which were highly unfavorable uh, for their development. So, just for example, uh, you know, there was this debate uh, at the end of the 1920s that these market reforms of the new economic policy, which were instituted after the Civil War in the Soviet Union to rebuild, restart its economy, and were successful to a certain level. You know, they, they, they brought themselves back in terms of GDP to their 1913 pre-World War I levels, but then they felt that they hit a ceiling where uh, they couldn't develop any further without capital which they didn't have access to, foreign investment capital. Uh, and so you had figures like Nikolai Buharin and Kyle Brzezinski and others uh, who did not want to take you know, this really hard war communism, complete central uh, 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 command economy planning uh, turn. Uh, but, uh, of course, Trotsky was arguing for something just like this. Uh, but when the Soviets uh, did decide to make that policy turn in that direction, one of the things they were counting on were world grain prices being at roughly the level that they were at in the middle of the 1920s uh, to fund the acquisition of the machinery, the factories, the tool and die equipment, etc., that they would need to industrialize. But what happened instead was that by the um, time that the Soviets under Stalin launched this effort, grain prices collapsed by 50%. <laughs> and so they had to make this decision. Do we go forward anyway? Uh, or, or do we back off? Because going forward would mean literally stealing uh, grain from peasants in order to f send it off for export to acquire the capital needed to buy machinery. Uh, and And you know, that's what happened. And so, you know, you had Stalin then essentially making war on peasants when they rationally refused to turn over their food to the central government that was not, in effect, paying them uh, for it. By the way, uh, Boris Kogorlitsky uh, wrote about this in a, uh, a book published about a decade ago. It was just a really marvelous work uh, called Empire of the Periphery. Uh, um, and, and, you know, lays this out very, very, very nicely. He, he would be a great person to talk with about this specific point. Yeah, I but, interviewed but, him but, about but, the, the current situation, but I, I will. Okay. I, in fact, maybe we should get the two of you guys on together. And He's an old friend of mine. About this. He's an old friend of All mine. Right, good. But, he, but I, I should say this. I mean, I, 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 we should not state that, you know, Lenin was, you know, some pure, nice, pleasant figure. Uh, you know, Bertrand Russell, of course, has that one anecdote about him when, he was speaking with him, and, and Lenin was, you know, talking about, uh, you know, how they were going to take care of, of the um, um, uh, manorial uh, elites, and you know, have them swing from the trees or whatever. And to to Bertrand uh, Russell's mind, Lenin seemed to be enjoying this conversation a little bit too much, <laughs> you know. So, uh, I, I, and I and I reference this in my article, not the Bertrand Russell uh, anecdote, but that. Gorbachev and Putin, in their own strange ways, reflect the two sides of Lenin's personality. Uh, Gorbachev, representing the side of Lenin that really believed in democracy and wanting to uh, create a Soviet economy, you know, of workers, councils, and, and all the rest, that that's ultimately where he wanted to go, even if he wasn't taking them there at that time. Uh, but that Putin, you know, represents the kind of brutal ruthlessness of Lenin, in terms of uh, achieving and implementing uh, his his goals. Um, in that paragraph I quoted, you say that Gorbachev kind of came back to that social democratic ideal of the of the revolution, um, yeah. and the Soviets, these workers' councils that were so much the instrument of the, of the strategy of the successful revolution, which seemed very democratic and raucous in terms of they would have meetings and argue yeah. and, and have votes, and so did the party. I, I, I was read transcripts of, uh, or reports on meetings of the Central Committee in the, in the, in the mid-late 20s, uh, 
and they and the and the congresses particularly and they were like arguing and fighting and there were factions and uh, they were quite democratic right um but was that simply not sustainable and if not why because that seemed to have this revolutionary democratic character and boy it's certainly turned into its opposite yeah uh molotov um i just you know an old anecdote about 20 years ago uh um, there was this political economist in the 20th century uh, someone of our generation that we would all know very well people today unfortunately have forgotten him his name was andre gunder frank uh and and uh, gunder was staying with me in riga at that time and you know he was looking for something to keep him busy he was an insomniac and i gave him a copy of uh, this book that had just been published uh, by a a Russian poet. His name was Felix Chuyev. It's a 750 odd page um, uh, set of interviews that he had done with Molotov over the course of uh, you know 30 years. You know, from the 1950s until his death, and whatever it was, 1986 or 1988. And I warned Gunder that he wouldn't be able to put it down, and of course he couldn't. It's just fascinating. But what Molotov, of course, argued in that book, because he was pushed on this point several times, well, you know, why did you kill all of these people? And, you know, Molotov, on one level, you know, he said eight of those ten people were guilty, so he admitted to an error rate of 20%, uh, which was horrible enough. Uh, but, uh, but then he said, well, look what happened in, in World War II. Do you think we could have fought that war with all this factionalism? Just the point that you're mentioning, Paul. Uh, you know, there's no way we could have successfully uh, executed that war and prevailed, you know, if we had this endless debating society going on. So I think that was the view of Stalin and some like-minded people that went along with him, was that uh, uh, this democracy just would not do if you were trying to develop the country uh, and its capacities in terms of industrialization and and all the rest. So it took that tragic, tragic turn. So I, that's another counterfactual that we'll never know the answer to. I mean, could they have survived the very tricky environment, not only of Europe, but internationally uh, in the early 1940s without uh, having done what they did? And I, I just, I think an important point of context uh, is that the, the so-called democ democratic West at the same time of the 20s and 30s was absolutely barbaric in terms of how it treated the Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and to a large extent, their own people. <clears throat> I saw a figure for the British Empire. <coughs> Over the 300 years of, of the British Empire, uh, one of the, an Indian historian estimated that the Brits killed 1.5 billion people. I mean, there's no, there's nothing like, there's no parallel to the war crimes of the British Empire, and uh, and it was Britain, the United States, and all the rest that 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 were the external threat to this socialism. So they yeah, weren't dealing that, with some democracies here. No, we weren't dealing with choir boys there. That's for sure. And uh, although th there was one real choir boy among all of these leaders, and that was Joseph Stalin, <laughs> when he was young, well, actually was a choir boy. But at any rate, um, uh, you mean li literally? <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, Mike Davis, uh, famed verso author and uh, you know, former labor organizer and academic, is, you know, he had that rejoinder to the, uh, the work that was published on, you know, the death toll of, uh, you know, the Black Book of Communism, as it was called. It was published about 20 years ago, where, you know, they got off the Burroughs adding machine and they started tallying up all of the numbers of people who have died tragically under communist uh, governments. And, you know, Mike D Davis got out his own Burroughs adding machine and started punching in all of the, the figures and, you know, came up with a, an even uh, higher number, uh, which his, that book was called Late Victorian Holocaust. And it did show the, you know, tragic death toll, of course, of imperialism. And I, in fact, I, my own small contribution to this, I, I published a book um, on the U.S. occupation of Haiti from 1915 to 1934. I wanted to get it out at the centenary, marking the conclusion uh, of that event. And so I published it in uh, 2015. I, well, at the you know, centenary of the beginning of the occupation, rather. And, uh, you know, 
50,000 uh, Haitians uh, died uh, in, in that uh, uh, occupation. So yeah, they're, 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 um, uh, big powers, let's just say that, big powers often do very bad things to maintain order. Uh, but, but I don't even want to get into a debate, you know, c uh, comparing uh, these. They're, they're, they're not apples to apples comparisons, uh, only in the sense that countries, especially big powers, going through modernization seem to do very, very bad things and when going through this period of, say, uh, capital accumulation. Uh, that said, that said, you know, as we used to call them, bourgeois democracies, um, they do have a space for resistance built uh, within them and it's tolerated at, at various, uh, you know, levels. Uh, but um, the, the elites... In, inter of, internally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Within, within uh, their own countries, yeah. Right, exactly, right, right. It's not very well tolerated abroad. But within their own countries they do because they, they um, need to have some degree of social peace. Uh, and um, um, the middle class, as it expands, you know, it's... And, and I don't mean, you know, in the suburban U.S. Canadian sense, which actually kind of doesn't exist, but, in, you know, in the 1960s and 50s and 70s and 80s, the two cars and the suburban garage and all that. But, but I mean, you know, the, the um, uh, builders and controllers of capital, you know, pretty soon their kids, uh, you know, became um, church ministers sometimes, or they became uh, academic professors, or they became heads of... Um, you know, non-governmental organizations, etc. So, you know, the, the kind of change in class composition of these uh, democracies, you know, made them in some ways more tolerant of uh, some change and even challenges to the social order at home. Not, not a the social order, of course, but but they did they did build in some protections. Not the same thing. Well, also the workers. For at least a certain amount of time, had some leverage and unions and fought for these democratic rights internally. Absolutely. But, but let's 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 park that as yeah. let's stick on the the Gorbachev Soviet thing for now. Sure. Uh, my only point was I was kind of agreeing with some, a point of your article. Uh, the external threat to this new Soviet republic was very real, and and they were, and these actors, the British and Americans and Europeans, seem so benign the way the history is written. But they were vicious colonialists and, and right. really barbaric. So the, right. the, the threat as an external factor in all this was, was serious. Oh, very. Um, and I, I just, I'm just going to raise one quick additional point, which will make everyone unhappy. And that is that it's also possible that while the Soviet Union was under constant attack from abroad, which it was, that even without that, it still would have evolved in the way it did. We, we, just, we just can't prove otherwise. Well, I, I, I personally think if they were going to try to build socialism the way, at the very least, Stalin, and, and I don't want to personalize it so much. He was the leader, but yep. you know, he had a whole class of academics and intellectuals and policymakers. I mean, it wasn't all just him, but at any no, rate. Right. Yep. But, but if you, to, to try to build it at the pace they had to build it, that's the big question mark for me that the, oh yeah and this is only from the point of view of not judging whether you know stalin you know we don't we don't have to decide who gets into heaven or not and i i assume stalin wouldn't make it but that said the, the, if you want to learn some lessons from it uh maybe they could have gone a hell of a lot more slowly especially in agriculture and uh, i didn't know this thing about the price of grain i get that yep. but you know to have to so quickly get to nationali nationalizing the land um, and state farms and, and expropriating uh, land. Like, I made a film, I don't know if you've seen it, probably not, but I made a film called The uh, uh, Albanian Journey, End of an Era. <clears throat> and I spent a lot of years in, in and out of Albania before the fall of the Communist Party, or Party of mm -hmm. Labor of Albania, and afterwards and all that. And they actually went a lot more slowly than the Soviet experiment, they they yeah. you know they, they didn't go to collective farms right right away. They kind of talked people into it. They persuaded. At least that's the way I understood the history. I mean, I yeah. wasn't there. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yeah. interestingly, interestingly, and fascinatingly, even the Soviets knew this was a failure. Uh, so uh, after World War II had concluded, and as the GDR, the you know German Democratic Republic East Germany, uh, uh, arose. Uh, you know, 
all of these communists in the Soviet bloc, they internalized all the ideological arguments of the, uh, of the Soviet Union and they wanted to replicate them. And the Soviets were trying to hold the communists of the GDR back saying, actually, you, you don't want to go ahead with this collectivization of agriculture. This mm. was done for very specific reasons and we kind of laid over this post facto justification for it that it was the best way to do it. Uh, but, uh, you know, there were other more complicated reasons, uh, which, you know, people just wouldn't understand, the average person, let alone peasant. And, you know, so don't do this. And, you know, in the GDR, they were like, what do you mean? I mean, this is obviously the best way to do it. They had uh, developed, uh, you know, their own uh, set of intellectuals who internalized these arguments and psychologically were just completely committed to them. Now, as it turns out, in the Soviet bloc, uh, they did end up, for the most part, going slower on uh, collectivization and other things for that reason. Places where they didn't, unfortunately, were the, the Baltic uh, states, which were incorporated into the Soviet Union as actual republics. And this is where it really, in terms of development today, this is where it makes a difference, uh, whether or not you uh, got incorporated into the Soviet Union or were merely under their control. To have been incorporated within them, I, you know, tended to do more damage. Hmm. Um, the other thing, uh, we're going to want to get back to your article, but uh, just to let people know, we're going to do more than one segment here because the, the, art the article, Jeffrey's article is so rich that, you know, one paragraph will kick us off for a half an hour of conversation and then we'll <laughs> keep going. Um, but I've, I've often thought or always think uh, that there one of the problems is once you get to a really modernized industrial economy, how the hell can you have central planning on such a scale with a pencil and paper? Yeah. I once had a guy, a stockbroker explain to me, you know, say to me, you know, before computers, subprime mortgages, all of this, you know, most of what goes on on Wall Street right now, it couldn't happen because you can't do it with a pencil and paper. It took digitization. It took computers. And, and I don't understand how they thought they could have central planning of such of a modern, fully industrialized, complicated economy and not lead to massive bureaucracy when you don't have, you know, computers and let alone artificial intelligence, which I, I think is important because now maybe there actually are conditions to have a planned economy in a way that yeah, doesn't right. get so bureaucratized. Right. And our economy is highly planned, as, as we know. Highly, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not just everyone doing their own thing. But you, you, sure, you, you couldn't do this with a slide rule <laughs> and a, a, a pencil. Uh, but, you know, when you're coming from a very backward uh, state, uh, central planning seems the way to go. I mean, because what it does is it, it, it marshals all of the resources of the economy and ensures that they are all moving in one direction, which you're absolutely right. Well, what happens when you reach a certain uh, level of economic development, uh, then that very same model that was so uh, necessary to helping you to achieve uh, industrialization on this accelerated basis, then becomes an impediment. And then you start adding new layers on top of that. But what happens when you get into the second generation of people who have lost that revolutionary zeal? Uh, and, and, and all they know is that no longer are they on the farm, literally, uh, but they've received high levels of education. And they've received levels of education to the extent that they start to uh, recognize where they are on the socioeconomic uh, ladder globally and they don't like the comparisons anymore. So, you know, especially if you're in the KGB, which did tend to attract uh, the best in the, well, not so much the best, but the brightest. And, uh, you know, they looked at themselves and said, why the hell are we as rich as these guys? I mean, you know, we're every bit as smart as them. Uh, and, and then they start beginning to question the entire uh, the basis of uh, a, a system which is not rewarding them to the level that they see as being commensurate with the Western democracies. Uh, so, I mean, as these systems, you know, when they're young uh, and they're producing high rates of economic growth and opportunities and modernization, sure, plenty of support, always some dissenters, of course, but, um, you know, plenty of support. But once that starts to fade, then you've, then you've got a problem. And then, you know, you know, the whole corruption, 
uh, issue. I, I don't want to blame that too much, but you know, it, it very much was real, and it, it did have a corrosive uh, uh, effect or impact on the uh, system, which you know made it uh, ungovernable uh, to some extent at a certain point, or at least very very difficult to govern, and it unleashed. Uh, all sorts of uh, tendencies that were damaging to the economy and society generally. But then there's also, you know, to go back to the um, faults, the uh, faults of the that were almost inherent uh, to the model, at least in terms of being born out of a civil war. Uh, and then Stalinism. I mean, one of the things that Stalinism did was it made people so distrustful. Now, on one level, you know, you could counter with you know, hey, uh, if you were building a new steel factory at Magnitogorsk in the, in, in, you know, in the 1930s and you were a worker that, you know, had come from nowhere and all of a sudden you received an education as an engineer, you were working with others and it, it was all very dynamic and open and it felt great. Uh, but uh, for so many people, um, what Stalinism created was a sense of fear and an inability to trust anyone, and a retreat ultimately into private life, exactly what you know socialism was not supposed to do. I mean, it created a hyper private life model where you you know sat around the kitchen table with your immediate family members and invited only trusted friends, and very trusted friends, and for conversations about how things really are. And so that sense of uh, distrust was. Uh, very, very damaging to, to the system. And uh, as your, because I watched your interview with uh, Alexander Puskalin, I mean, he's absolutely right. You had these openings, you know, during the Khrushchev period a bit, and then, of course, uh, under Gorbachev uh, as well. Uh, but um, where I have spent years and years and years in Latvia, you know, there was this um, uh, attempt by ethnic Latvians themselves to reform communism. They were called the National Communists. And uh, um, the ethnic Latvian Stalinists plus the Soviet generals ganged up on the national communists to, to get rid of them because, you know, they were threatening to destabilize the system. And um, uh, uh, this did not come to Khrushchev's attention until very, very late in the game. And Khrushchev came blowing into Latvia at one point and he said, what the hell is wrong with you guys? The, the, this this Berklovs guy, he was the head of the National Communists, so he was the head of the Council of Ministers. This is exactly what we need. He's shaking things up. He's blowing through the bureaucracy. He's getting stuff done. And, and you guys are, are sending him, not quite to Siberia, but to the Urals for seven years? Uh, this, is, this is atrocious. So, at any rate, uh, the, the problem was recognized by by people like Khrushchev and some others that, I mean, this, is, this was not the model that you wanted, but that bureaucracy became just too, um, too powerful and uh, uh, it ultimately took full control. I want to correct one thing I said earlier, mm -hmm. uh, that all the f uh, existing forms of socialism or attempts to build socialism ended up in authoritarianism or dictatorship or something. And actually, Venezuela is an exception, uh, at least for quite some time. Uh, I, w I was there several times during the Chavez years. And it was a re an attempt to build socialism. Uh, and, and it was as democratic as one could possibly imagine, at least during the Chavez years. Uh, it doesn't mean there weren't some bureaucrats and, 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 and hacks in power, there were, I met, I met a few of them um, during Chavez's time, but on the whole, uh, what was going on amongst the people in terms of people's councils and organizing, and the opposition actually perhaps too much freedom to own television channels. And the coup against Chavez in 2002 to a large extent was owned, organized actually through television channels that were yeah. owned by the rich. And, 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 I, and I actually think Chavez made a mistake not putting them in jail afterwards. It was amazing how many of the people that helped facilitate that coup never paid a price for it. Um, but in the end, I think there's a lesson he, Chavez didn't learn from Soviet Union. Uh, 
was go slow. He didn't. He tried to fight on every single front at the same time. He wanted to, you know, have agricultural reform and fishing reform and every kind of reform instead of just focusing on the oil sector and solve that first. And yeah. if he'd gone more slowly, you, we might have seen something that was working with a socialist agenda and very quite democratic. Possible, and I, I'm, I'm no expert on Venezuela, so I haven't been there, so I'm not going to comment on it other than, you know, the one criticism that I would have of uh, Chavez is that uh, they did neglect the cash cow, which was oil. In other words, they were not making investments, and for, you know, noble reasons, they were trying to invest in the social sector, but they, they really needed to uh, invest more in um, uh, uh, keeping the technology of the oil industry current and we're not making the investments to the degree that they did and that yeah, caused and, some and, problems and later. Using the, and using the money they did have to also diversify the economy. They thought yeah. high prices would last forever and that yeah, was yeah. dreaming. Anyway, we're not... But, but I, I, just one my only last point last is there's, there's, yes. there's lots of evidence that socialism doesn't have... Yeah, yeah. There, there's ways to develop it. If the external factors allow, and that's a big deal, because if the Americans were about to invade, I don't think it would have been so democratic. All right, we're going to do a second segment, and, and we're going to focus on how Gorbachev's reforms actually laid the groundwork for the rise of the oligarchs and, and the rise of uh, uh, what uh, Booz Gallen calls Jurassic capitalism. Uh, so join us for the next segment with Jeffrey Summers. Thanks, Jeff. And thank you for joining us on theanalysis.news. Please, again, don't forget the donate button. Come on over to the website where you can donate. And most importantly, get on the email list uh, because there's no doubt if you're watching this on YouTube, YouTube is uh, suppressing uh, people that are uh, subscribing. The, we're getting tons of mail from people saying that YouTube just is not letting them know. By the way, if you, you are supposed to hit the bell or something like that up top to make sure you get alerts. But we're getting emails from people that have done that and still don't get messaged. Uh, and, and for people who don't know the history, YouTube you know, tried to suppress several of our stories. And it was only because Matt Taibbi wrote a, wrote a piece talking about censoring us and, and, and directly questioned YouTube that they kind of backed off a little bit. Um, at any rate, thanks for joining us on the analysis.news.